to our Stat Sisters Special Nursing Week mini pod episode. This week, we interviewed nurses and asked them to share their nursing stories and advice. I had a great time talking with these fabulous nurses. I hope you enjoy this special mini podcast. Oh, good morning. This is Carrie, and I have a special treat. I'm interviewing different nurses and nursing students for Nurses Week, and we'll be putting all of those on our um, podcast as little little mini, mini podcasts, not the mini podcasts that we're used to, but um, even smaller ones, but we're going to be highlighting nurses, so whoop, whoop. It's awesome. Um, I have today um, a nursing student who is in her last semester. Is that right? Yes. And her name is Isabella Dale Bayo. Is it Bello? Del Bello. Del Bello. And she is here, and she's going to tell us um, a little bit about um, why she became a nursing student, why she wants to be in nursing, and then a little bit about what we were talking about in our previous podcast about the barriers to getting into nursing school because there are some and we are going to talk a little bit about that. So it's about why did you, I'm sure you've answered this question like a million times, but why did you want to become a nurse? I actually really like answering this question. <laughs> um, so when I was born, my mom had me alone. So once I found that out, I got to thinking how many other women go through that every day. So she had like an unattended birth? Yeah, well, just my dad wasn't there, so. Oh, so she was like in a hospital setting. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. So I thought maybe she was one of those free birthers that are no. like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. Okay. Okay, cool. Clarification, good. So she mm-hmm. wasn't, but she didn't have any support during exactly. birth. Exactly. Okay. So I just started thinking about how common that must be. And so I was raised by my grandmother and my mom and my aunt. So I've been surrounded by women my whole life. So I just am deeply in touch with the feminine spirit. And I support women's rights because that's that's all I know. And it's very important to me, women's health. So I experienced a hard time in my life where my grandmother got really sick from breast Mm -hmm. cancer and I started seeing how nurses treated her. I've seen some of the best nurses and some of the worst and when she died there was one hospice nurse. I don't know her name but I'll never forget her. She somehow turned my devastation into acceptance Mm -hmm. and peace. I don't really know how she did it exactly yet, but it was her bedside manner. So she taught me that dying is not always the worst thing, especially when someone's suffering. So I started seeing a gynecologist, um, and then I started to learn more and then Google things, and I found that I really loved it. And then I really love labor and delivery, and I think it's probably one of the most emotionally charged areas of medicine Mm -hmm. because, you know, there's fear of being a new parent or fear that something's wrong with the baby, fear of not knowing what's going to happen, anxiety, um, the dad feels helpless. Right. um, And you're so vulnerable in that situation with, you know, all these people coming in and watching your delivery. So I think that I would have a good bedside manner with these women Mm -hmm. because I understand them and I really want to help them transition and just show them that they don't have to be scared and it's okay to be scared and that, you know, they can be a good parent and, you know, if, if I get off at seven but they're in labor and they want me to stay, I'll stay late so that I can hold their hand. Oh, gosh, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I was. Like, mm-hmm. I would stay so late. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really interesting. Erin um, and I have talked before about hospice nurses because they are like angels. They are. And um, and we've talked about how OB and hospice are really like sister practices because everybody's born, everyone dies. Right. And... Those are two areas where the family is so important. They're always important to whatever Mm -hmm. you're going through, but birth and death, it's it's about them too, um, more than 
in some of the other um, like clinical areas. And so I think it's really interesting that you went like were first interested kind of in nursing through your grandmother's experience and mm-hmm. your experience with hospice that you want to go to OB. Mm-hmm. I, think, I feel like that is something I see a lot, like those two affinities. Um, so thank you for sharing that. I think that's beautiful and um, kind of something sustainable. Like you're going to be able to draw on that because nursing is not easy. No. There's a lot of things I'm sure you've already seen where yeah. it, it's hard. Yeah. But having that foundation, I think you're going to be able to draw on that throughout your career and kind of just be like, this is why I'm doing this, even when it's really hard. So tell me kind of um, when you were thinking about going to nursing school and you were applying, like what are some of the barriers because you said that you had applied a few times and then finally got in. Right. Well, my biggest barrier, I think, was um, that I submitted my transcripts mm-hmm. and that that was it. Um, so they just looked at my grades. And even though my grades were good, um, there wasn't anything more. Mm-hmm. And I feel like, so I applied to nursing school three times total. And I got rejected uh, twice and then I was discouraged so I waited a year before I applied again because I was very discouraged and my family was to the point where they were discouraging me from trying again and they wanted me to pick something else. They're tired of seeing you like rejected right? Right. (laughs) But they just also thought that you know I couldn't do it because nursing had to have these certain requirements and that I didn't meet them Mm -hmm. and that might be what a lot of people think Um, but I said, no, I want to be a nurse. I can absolutely do this. I'm going to do this. So I applied that third time and I finally got in. But I think that if I would have been able to get an interview or to write an essay, I think that I could have gotten in the first time that Mm -hmm. I tried. Right. Because it's more than grades, the grades and like how many points you have. It's about the passion. Right. And I'm sure you felt like, well, I'm assuming it, it sounds like you felt a calling to nursing. Absolutely. Um, nursing is the only thing I've ever wanted to do. So I had no choice but to keep trying to get into nursing school because there was nothing else I wanted. So. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah, that that's really good. I'm glad that you stuck to it because now you're almost done. Yes. <laughs> now you're almost done and you're going to be moving on. And you were talking a little bit about um, earlier that you've been applying to a nurse residency programs, which yes. for those old timers like me, we didn't really have nurse residency programs before, but they are like medical residency where you apply to a certain specialty and then you sometimes are like a few months or a whole year and you um, are really kind of mentored and get extra classes and really become a proficient nurse um, more quickly um, in many cases than you would like how it used to be where you just got a job wherever you could and then you just started working. I remember like I got a great um, orientation when I started um, compared to what people like 5, 10, 20 years before me got. I got um, 18 shifts on the unit I was working and um, they were like, wow, that is so much. And now that's like almost nothing. So, like, 18 shifts when I started was like, wow, you're going to be, like, that's so much time. Um, But now people have, like, six months where they're being precepted, and that's, like, much more common. So you've been trying to get into a nurse residency program like that. So tell me about kind of your experience shifting from a senior into the workforce. Well, uh, we have clinicals at different hospitals throughout the medical center, and you get precepted through clinicals and you get a chance to network and meet other people and I thought that that would give me an opportunity to network and get a residency out of it Mm -hmm. but that has not happened for me everyone who I've worked with has really liked me but there's always an obstacle such as the hospital doesn't offer a residency program Mm -hmm. or they don't know who does the hiring or who I need to talk to. Mm -hmm. So I've gotten letters of recommendation and I've applied to different hospitals. I got rejected from one and it's also 
depends on where you apply, whether you get it or not, because a lot of people want to go to the best hospitals Mm -hmm. and no one wants to go to the outlying hospitals. Right. So I'm kind of stuck in between, do I want to drive 40 minutes to work every day for two years because you have to have a two-year contract and if you break it you have to pay five thousand dollars in a fine if you break oh my contract. goodness right so and I want to work close to home but also they don't I haven't gotten it called for any interviews it's very competitive so I do feel a little discouraged about what to do because I don't know should I just take whatever or should I stick it out and try to get something that I really want and I feel conflicted because I didn't really know that this is what it was going to be like Mm -hmm. and I just all my friends are getting jobs and they're getting hired and I haven't heard anything from any hospitals so so are you only focused right now on um, women's health like you're trying to get into like L&D or mom baby or something or are you like open to more well, I want to do labor and delivery, or I would do mother and baby. I would do antepartum. I would do neonatal ICU as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but really, I would take anything because I do feel discouraged. And all throughout nursing school, everyone told me how hard it is to get into L&D. Mm-hmm. It is. It, I, I know it is. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. But that's the only thing I really want to do, and I can't hold out forever for that. So yeah, you, you need to work. I know. I definitely need to work. <laughs> yep. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I started out in med surge, mm-hmm. and I kind of was, like, thinking I would go right into L&D, but then my plans changed. And so, like, my sweet little position that I had set up mm-hmm. uh, evaporated because I had to move across the country. Mm-hmm. And I just needed a job because I had, at that point, I had three kids. And I was like, I need a job. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I took a medicine job, and that was the best. I was so thankful. And I've been thankful that I had that those skills and kind of was able to become a nurse um, in that environment. So if you can't find something, I know it's super disappointing but my advice is do take something closer to home that is like med search and then just keep going until you get to L and D. I actually did apply for med search positions because I knew that it was very competitive. Just to find any residency in general is competitive. Mm-hmm. Everyone wants everyone's applying, everyone's graduating at the same time. Exactly. Everyone wants to get hired. So it's just hard. But I want to be re- well rounded as well. Mm-hmm. So I have no problem starting in med surge. And you were going to be like a superstar L&D nurse because <laughs> of that med surge. I'm serious. Yeah. And then when things happen, like the first time I, one of my patients seized on L&D, I was like, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. but the first time a patient sees that for a person that's only been in L&D and they freak out, not all the time. I'm not going to say every single person freaks out, but um, it is much more distressing because you haven't been to like a billion codes and you haven't done all this other stuff that you do all the time on med surge. You see right. everything. And so you, it'll serve you so well. If that's the route that you end up going, mm-hmm. it'll serve you well. I promise it'll be worth it. Well, I applied, <laughs> so if I get it, I'll take it. <laughs> Good. Mm-hmm. Um, so do you have, we talked a little bit to, uh, earlier too about um, like kind of your women's um rights advocacy and you have already noticed and um she uh, miss bella has been at several different hospitals so this is not like specific to any hospital in houston but um, i've talked about this before too um my hope and frustrations around um women's autonomy and labor and kind of the support of that do you feel like comfortable talking about any of those experiences yeah okay do you want to share one of them where you felt like kind of the paternalism of the medicine (laughs) was competing with a woman's autonomy yes um well first of all I think the lithotomy position is not really the best as you're pushing against gravity Mm -hmm. um so 
It's the best for somebody. Let's be clear. It's yes, the best for the, for the atten- <laughs> attending. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, because you do watch doula videos mm-hmm. and midwives and they kind of let you squat and do what feels comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's interesting that that's not in practice in hospitals. Mm-hmm. But some other specific things that I've seen is um, actually my first delivery I've ever seen. The doctor said, you pooped on me. Oh, no. And I felt really bad for the patient because labor is already probably the most vulnerable moment of a woman's life. And everyone is in the room. Everyone's staring at you. Everyone's watching. Mm -hmm. And then the physician says that, you know, you stooled. And then everyone now knows that. And you're humiliated. Right. And you don't have as much dignity as you started with. Mm-hmm. Um, I've also seen a doctor discourage natural labor. And the doctor suggested highly that next time an epidural should be in place. Oh, why did they say that? I don't know. Because I honestly felt that she tolerated the natural birth very well. Mm-hmm. She didn't make any fuss until the baby was crowning, Mm -hmm. but she did great. Well, that's, that's in a very intense moment. Have you had children yet? No. Okay. That's the most intense moment. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So even the most stoic, calm, coping women, I mean, that is a point where they're like, yeah. Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. But if that was the only time that she really seemed to have trouble with it, then I feel like she did a great job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, even if she didn't cope well, if that's what she wanted the next time, mm-hmm. yeah, more power to but her. But she did cope well. Mm-hmm. She One more push and the baby was out, and it was over, and she was fine. So I don't think that doctors should discourage people from having a natural birth if that's something that they want. Mm-hmm. I do think there should be more consideration for what the patient wants and a lot of the times nurses and doctors will kind of laugh if someone comes in with a birthing plan Mm -hmm. (laughs) I know things go awry but I do think you should respect absolutely if they have a birthing plan they've been thinking about this for a long time maybe they've been having a really hard time conceiving and this Mm -hmm. is their this is one shot this is their one shot and this is how they wanted it Mm -hmm. I think it should be honored Absolutely. So you don't know this because we just met today. I, I I snagged this poor nursing student from the nursing station. <laughs> and I was like, hey, I wanted to get your insights on some stuff. Anyway, but I just finished my doctoral degree. And Congratulations. Thank you. That was the focus of my work was um, birth preferences. Oh, okay. <laughs> and how we support them. Uh-huh. So it was like a huge deal. And mm-hmm. like statistically, women that have birth plans, even if the birth plans fall apart and nothing even works, like they have a better birth experience Mm -hmm. and they have, um, if you have a birth plan, um, like a written birth plan, then you have better outcomes. So the, there's a myth that they all end up in the OR and they, you know, they all have like shoulder dystocias and crazy stuff happen, but it's just not true. Right. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So yes. Okay. Um, let me think if there's anything else. Is there anything else that you're like, I would really love to say that? Let me think. Hmm. I don't know. Um, Maybe I'll say one thing is um, every day I'm reminded of why I want to be a nurse. Um, Being able to peek inside of someone's life and a very intimate moment of their life when they see their baby's face for the first time it's really touching and you know if um, a patient is scared and they reach for your hand that is when I feel the most that I am a nurse even though I'm not registered yet (laughs) I haven't graduated but I feel like I am one inherently well. And I'm reminded of when people have small gestures like that. Well, um, thank you for sharing that. 
we were, me and Aaron were talking about how nursing is more than a job. It is who you are. And obviously that's who you are. Right. I'm so <laughs> touched that you like share that with me. And I'm so glad I got to know you a little bit. Today. I'm glad too. It's really <laughs> nice to meet you today. And I think you're going to be an excellent nurse. Thank you. <laughs> Wherever you go, you, we'll have to keep in touch so I can kind of follow your career. Um, but like, I think I just have a great feeling about you. The moment I saw you, I was like, she's a kindred spirit. So thanks so much for um, joining us. This, um, I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it was been my pleasure. Okay. Thank you.